In this video, I will describe to you the history of the Chinese people in West Malaysia and Singapore based on my most recent research. Well, this is not the first video that I have done on this particular subject, but over time, I have uncovered new discoveries about the history of the Chinese and it's worthwhile for me to do a revision of my videos so that I can give you whatever that is the latest that I have put together. And of course, this would not be the end of everything. I will continue to do research on the history of the Chinese in West Malaysia and Singapore and as I continue to uncover new information and facts I will add in and perhaps in the future you might find another new video that explain this information. My earlier videos are all on my Learn Penang Hokkien web, uh, YouTube channel which you can also view and get some details. Uh, by and large, what I'm going to share with you today is built up on the earlier research and information which I've shared in my earlier videos and uh, this is a research that I've been doing for the past 11 years as I continue to uncover details which at times may seem controversial if it collides with pre-existing knowledge and information that we have around us about the history of the Chinese in West Malaysia and Singapore. I'm using the term West Malaysia and Singapore to denote the Chinese who, who populate this Malay Peninsula or uh, because it happens to be in two countries and one of them is part of Malaysia, I will say West Malaysia and Singapore and by that I mean the entire peninsula all the way down to Singapore. So in this video, I will be talking about words that might be commonplace to you but I may be giving it new meaning and after you go through this video, you might find that you will have a new understanding of the words that I'm using. And the words are, some, some of the words are quite commonplace. Like for example, I'm going to talk about four different words. The first one is Peranakan. The second is Babanyonya. The third is Lao Ke. And the fourth is Sing Ke. So, in this history of the Chinese in West Malaysia and Singapore, we are going to segment them into these four different groups because based on what I have uncovered, I consider these four different groups as, although uh, related, they are actually distinct one from the other. And of course, you are going to say that Peranakan and Babanyonya, they are the same, aren't they? Well, after this video, you will have an understanding that Peranakan and Baba Nyonya are actually distinct. They are different, but they have been mixed together so long ago that right now, it's impossible to tear them apart. However, there is a distinction between Peranakan and Baba Nyonya, and I will explain in this video. And if it helps to use an analogy, think of Peranakan as coffee and babanyonya as sugar so peranakan and babanyonya is like coffee mixed with sugar after coffee is mixed with sugar what do you get you still get a drink that is coffee so the same way peranakan mixed with babanyonya can still be considered as peranakan and then let's consider lao ke as uh, milk so coffee mixed with sugar, mixed with milk, it is still coffee, but with milk. And once you mix it together, it's hard to tear it apart. And that's how it is from our 21st century viewpoint, everything looks to be like one. But actually, uh, it is one form of different ingredients. So the first thing is coffee, the second is sugar, lao ke is the milk, and after that, the last one is sing ke. Sing ke, let's consider it as ice, ice cubes. So coffee plus sugar plus milk plus ice cube, you get ice coffee, but it's still coffee. The ice in the beginning may be distinct on its own, but 
over time it is diluted and is become part of the coffee and that is how it is with our history which is right now it's difficult for us to understand to comprehend because it seems to be that everything is one and the same but it's actually different ingredient different components that form what we have today and it's worthwhile to tear it all apart and from my research I find that it's worthwhile to tear it all apart so that you can understand ah so this is Peranakan ah this is Baba Nyonya this is Lao Cat and this is Sing Cat by the way the term Lao Cat and Sing Cat are Hokkien words because by and large the history of the Hokkien uh, of the Chinese in West Malaysia and Singapore is largely the history of the Hokkien settlers in this region. It is the Hokkien settlers, not even myself, I'm actually part Cantonese, I'm singing, but this is the history of the Hokkien settlers in the peninsula and you will find that the roots is in Hokkien words. So Lao Cat means old guests or old timers. Sing Cat means new guests or newcomers. So these are the third and fourth influx. So I can say that there are four different influx of settlers who arrive in this region. Chinese settlers, I mean, and by Chinese settlers, predominantly Hokkien. When I say predominantly Hokkien, I'm referring to the Hokkien province itself, Fujian province. Fujian province has Hokkien people, but it also has Teochew, it has Hakka. And by the time of the Singhat, there is also Hainanese and so on who arrive in this region. And in between, there are Cantonese who arrive. But the history of the Chinese in the peninsula is by and large the history of the Hokkien migration to, to this region. And we'll start with the Peranakan. So in this rather lengthy video, we are going to go one by one, starting with the Peranakan. And when I say Peranakan, I'm referring to Chinese Peranakan. I'm not referring to Peranakan Jawi or the Chiti. Peranakan Jawi and Chiti, they have their own history. I have not gone deep into the research on their history. I would expect their history to be very, very different from the history of the Chinese. It just happens to be that they are applying the umbrella term Peranakan to all these otherwise very, very different groups of people. So, when I say Peranakan, I am referring to the Chinese Peranakan. And Chinese Peranakan, Peranakan is like apple to oranges to watermelon for the uh, Peranakan Jawi and for the Chiti. So, let's put away, put aside Peranakan Jawi and Chiti. We are going to focus on the Chinese Peranakan. And in this video, when I say Peranakan, I am referring to the Chinese Peranakan. So, the history of the Chinese Peranakan goes all the way back to the history of the Malacca Sultanate as well as the Portuguese and Dutch administrations. And we have to look at the history of Fuchan province itself. If you understand the geography of Fuchan province, where the Hokkien people come from, you will know that it is a mountainous province. And because it's a mountainous province, the Hokkien people find that to make a life for themselves is much easier to go on maritime trade. So they would rather become fishermen, they become merchants, and at times pirates. And that is how they, that's their source of income. That, that's the source of the livelihood of the people of Fuchan province. And in southern Fuchan province, there are two main cities, port cities. And these two port cities uh, flourished, became significant or less significant at different parts of history. The two port cities are Changzhou and Quanzhou. And so the history of the Chinese in, uh, in the West Malaysia and Singapore is going to be intertwined with the history of uh, the port cities of Changzhou and Quanzhou. If you look at the history of Changzhou, let's 
go with Changzhou first because Changzhou comes earlier in this part of history. Even though the uh, Chang Changzhou was significant and then Changzhou became significant and then Changzhou declined and then Xiamen and Changzhou become significant and so on. But uh, we are going to now dive into the history of the Puranakan. And for Puranakan, it's it coincides with the time when Changzhou becomes a prominent port city. And uh, during that part of history from the from the 16th until the 18th centuries, the Changzhou merchants as were seafarers. They would go to different entrepôts or port cities in order to trade. They would bring along things like porcelain. The porcelain from, Sing, uh, from Changzhou is highly desired. This is Ming porcelain. We are talking about Ming dynasty right now. So it's Ming porcelain brought out by the merchants from Changzhou and they will go to different port city to trade whenever there is a port for them to trade. On the Malay Peninsula, that port is Malacca. Malacca was the only sea port for the Malay Peninsula during that time. There was no Penang at that time. There was no Singapore at that time. There's no Kuala Lumpur, Ipoh, and so on. There were small, small fishing villages like Mua and maybe Kuala Muda and so on. But the significant one was Malacca. So the, the merchants of Changzhou would go to Malacca to trade. And they would go to other places also, such as to Batavia, to Ayutthaya, to Manila and so on to trade and they will follow the monsoon the monsoon will take them to Malacca they may have to wait for a few months for the monsoon to change and they, that will take them to some other places so while they were in Malacca to strengthen their business ties in Malacca they would take on local women in other words, they were marry Malay women. At that time, it is still totally possible for Malays to marry into a Chinese family with and convert to become a Chinese. Because um, even at that point in time, some of the Malays were Hindus, not all of them were Muslim, and many of them do not even have any religion. So they were in the process of accepting and being introduced to different faiths maybe to Taoism, maybe to Buddhism, to Hinduism, as well as to Islam. So there were Malay women who, uh, who married into the family of the Changzhou merchants and this allowed the, the Changzhou merchants to have a foothold in Malacca itself. And there is at least someone, perhaps the, the woman's family can help to look after his trading business in Malacca while he goes all over the place to do continue on his seafaring trading. The, the seafaring merchants were able to impart his culture to the local population, that is to say, the attire, the festivities, the the buildings, and so on. But one thing they he cannot pass on to his children, in particular, who were born to him in Malacca, was his language, because firstly he is a merchant, he is not a teacher, and he is not someone to raise a family. He can father a family, but he is not around to raise the family. And so, the, his children in Malacca, and by the way, his children in Malacca is not his only family. He has his main family back in Fuchen province. And uh, so, he has one family in Fuchen province. He has one family in, in Malacca. And I would not be surprised if he has another one in Batavia, one in Manila, and one in Ayutthaya, and so on. So, he has uh, his satellite family in Malacca, raised by his Malay wife and so his Malay wife for of course is going to speak Malay he's going to speak Malay and so the children is going to be speaking Malay it is much easier for him the Chinese merchant to learn Malay than for everybody else to learn his language 
they can learn the name of words. They can learn it uh, because some of the words around him, let's say in his culture, is not available. Then they can learn. Maybe the word is ang pao, for example, or kong si, and so on. So words like ang pao, kong si, and so on will seep into the Malay language. And because the children of his generation were uh, given birth to, then it, in Malay is berana. So from berana we get the word peranakan. So the peranakan is exclusively for this group of people who is uh, fathered, sired by the Chinese seafaring merchants. So we have a group of Chinese people who are otherwise Chinese, but they speak Malay because the father wasn't around long enough to teach them the language. The father is always on the move according to the monsoon. And so, the father might not even settle down in Malacca. Eventually, the father may go back to Changzhou or maybe Quanzhou in Fujian province and settle back with his main family in the Hokkien province. And so, uh, the subsequent generations have to make do and survive looking Chinese, but Chinese, but speaking Malay. And that is the first group that we are going to talk about, which, which is the Peranakan. And as you can see here, I'm doing a distinction between the Peranakans and the Babanyonya. Because if we want to like pry it tight apart, we can see that actually the Babanyonyas are different from the Peranakans. So, but nowadays, it's all like mixed up together. Like I, as I've said, iced coffee. It's iced coffee nowadays. So the, the, in the same iced coffee, we have the Peranakan. So when we talk about Peranakan culture and so on, we are referring to a, something that is more, because it's something branded. People want something that is high class. But I'm going to explain it from the historical context. Where, how do we get where we are? Okay, how do we get to where we are? Because in the beginning, we can't say even that the, the Peranakans are wealthy. At that point in time, in the 17th or 18th century, I can't say that they are even wealthy yet. The wealth will come later. And the wealth might be the contribution of later influx of the Chinese to West Malaysia and Singapore. So, uh, let's park aside Peranakans. We are going to now go into the history of the second influx of the Chinese to West Malaysia and Singapore. So, up to now, there's only one city uh, in the Malay Peninsula, and that is Malacca. Now, now we move on to the 17th century. 17th century is a transitional period between the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. In 1644, the Ming Dynasty collapsed with the suicide of the final emperor because the Manchu were, was already invading and has just overrun Beijing. And from Beijing, the Manchus start to invade the rest of China province by province. And so one province after another fell to Manchu rule. And the Manchus established the new dynasty, which is the Qing dynasty. However, when the Manchus arrive in Fujian province or Hokkien province, there is a fierce resistance to Manchu rule. There were still Ming loyalists who want to prop up the collapsed Ming dynasty and perhaps uh, put up a new Ming emperor in place of the one that has already liquidated himself. So there was fierce resistance during that time. And some of that resistance was led by a guy by the name of Kosing Ya or Chen Chen Kong. And he he was instrumental in resisting the Manchus, but eventually he too was defeated. And the Manchus, during this period of time of resistance, and also 
Consequently, to the resistance, the Manchu were very harsh to the people of Fuchen province. And in particular, to, to ensure that there's no more resistance to Manchu rule, the Manchus conducted what is called the Great Clearance. The Great Clearance is when the Manchus forced everybody who live along the coast of Fuchen province to move inland. That way, they could not assist the, uh, the rebels because the rebels were holding out in Taiwan. The rebels fled mainland China and were holding out in Taiwan. So, to prevent the, the Ming loyalist rebels from aiding and trying to uh, resist Manchu rule, they decided to clear the coastal villages of Fuchen province. So everybody had to move inland. But they were moving into places that were already populated and not at all welcoming to receiving a sudden influx of refugees. And some of these places, are they have to move into mountainous areas. As I've mentioned earlier, Fuchen province is a mountainous uh, province. And so it is uh, a matter of uh, survival that is almost impossible for the refugees of coastal Fujian province to survive if they were to move inland. So the other option is to move out of Fujian province. And here they leverage on the existing knowledge of the maritime routes because the Fujian people were traditionally mercantile. They were maritime uh, merchants who traveled across Southeast Asia to trade. However, in this uh, particular part of turbulence and upheaval, everybody has to move. So it's either you move inland or you move outward. Moving outward is not according to Manchu requirement. Uh, in fact, the Manchu people, the Manchu authorities wanted to move inland. So, moving away and out into the sea is fleeing as refugees. So, they, the, the Hokkien people, particularly of these two port cities of Changzhou and Quanzhou, took to the sea. Rather than living under Manchu rule, and Manchu, the Manchus uh, established, put on a very difficult rule for them. And one of them is that they have to start wearing queue. Kyu means Tao Chang. Uh, they have to wear the Tao Chang or Kyu. And that is the Manchu style of uh, uh, dressing for men. So the men have to shave their head and then wear a long ponytail or pigtail, which is the Kyu. That is not how uh, how the how the uh, how the Hokkien people dress during the Ming period. So during the Ming period they don't wear Kyu. The Qiu or Tao Chang is worn during the Qing Dynasty or the Manchu period. But the Hokkien people do not want to dress like that. They find it humiliating that they have to uh, succumb to this form of enforcement from the Manchus. So that's why they decided to pack up and leave. But uh, they are living harsh, uh, harshly, I mean quietly, secretly. Because if they were caught, they would most definitely be executed. So they, if they were already merchants, then they will have access to both. But if they were not merchants, then you have to pay for their access to live, uh, to live Fuchen province, to populate somewhere else, somewhere other than Fuchen province and somewhere other than places that is being ruled by the Manchus. So the places that they fled to are the most easy is Taiwan. Taiwan is the nearest of them all. And so there's a, such a huge influx of Fujian uh, migrants into Taiwan that they overwhelm the existing population. So much so that today, the language of Taiwan, which we say Taiwanese, is actually traced back to the language of the Fujian migrants. 
Of course, there are many influx and waves of migrants, but this is one of the significant migrants when uh, during the transition between the Ming and Qing dynasty in China. So Taiwan received a significant uh, influx of migrants from Fujian province, but so did other places in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, Vietnam, Siam, Borneo, Java, and the Malay Peninsula. And on the Malay Peninsula, there's two different groups of Fujian migrants that arrived. But uh, at this point in time, I want to uh, remember, explain something that differentiates the Peranakans from this new group of people. The Peranakans were fathered by seafaring merchants. The seafaring merchants were all entirely men. During that time, only men could become merchants to come out of Fujian province through the port city of Changzhou and Quanzhou in order to trade. Women have to stay home to look after the household or uh, to raise children. Women have no business leaving Changzhou or Quanzhou. Uh, they have no business leaving China. Only the merchants were allowed to leave China in order to trade. Now, this new influx of refugees, they are refugees, they were not merchants. So it's not just men who left, it is the whole family who left. Mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, children, grandchildren, niece, nephews, everybody left. Men, women, children, livestock, dogs, uh, goats, whatever that they have, all the possession, if they can pay for the passage to leave China secretly, they would do so. If they have the, their own boats, better still. They would just flee, flee in the day of night quietly so that they would not get caught. But flee they did. And they were so numerous in numbers that it was almost impossible for the Manchu authorities or Manchu soldiers to apprehend them. <laughs> this like, is helter-skelter going all over Southeast Asia. Taiwan and the rest of Southeast Asia. And in the Malay Peninsula, there are two distinct groups that arrived. The Changzhou refugees settled on the northern part of the peninsula. The Quanzhou group settled on the southern part of the peninsula. So at that time, made possible uh, ports or towns such as Nakhonsi Tamarat or Songkla or Kuala Muda and Phuket, those are the places that they settled in. Those are the Changzhou group. And the Changzhou group settled on the southern part, including Malacca. So Malacca has now received two successive influx of Chinese migrants, but they were different. One is the Peranakans who receive them speaking Malay. To the Chinese arriving, the Chinese who arrive speak Hokkien. And depending on where they come from, they could be speaking the Changzhou Hokkien or the Quanzhou of Hokkien. But uh, the southern uh, part of the peninsula received the settlers or refugees from the Quanzhou Hokkien. So the, the difference between the Peranakan and the this group is that this group are Malay, uh, men, women, children, and livestock. Whereas the first group is all men, so the subsequent generation is speaking Malay. They were all fathered by the Malay woman and they were the Peranakan. This one, if you are going to be distinct about it, is not the Peranakan already. However, they are the men and the woman, so they are the Baba. Nyonya. And so, the second group is the Baba Nyonya. The first group is the uh, Peranakan. The Peranakan is exclusive to Malacca. The Baba Nyonya is not exclusive to Malacca. It is spread across the peninsula. And de depending on which part of the peninsula, they could be um, speaking the Changzhou dialect on the northern part of the peninsula or the Quanzhou dialect on the southern part of the peninsula. 
and here they are isolated and cut off from China because to prevent people from further fleeing China, the Changzhou, uh, the Manchu authorities closed the ports of Changzhou and Quanzhou for a few decades. So no more maritime trades during a, a certain period in the 17th century. Merchants cannot get out and people who have fled cannot get back in. So those refugees who have fled and resettled in the peninsula as well as elsewhere in Southeast Asia, they are now cut off from China. There is no Tui Teng Sua. Tui Teng Sua means to return to China. No Tui Teng Sua for them. So how to survive in this place where everything is now different? For example, no wheat. No wheat, so cannot make bread. So improvise. They, they have to improvise. Use whatever that's available. So in this region, there's no wheat, but there's still rice. So if we, we cannot use wheat to make bread, we use rice and instead of wheat noodle, we create rice noodle. So from the improvision we have the the cuisine that we now today know as the nyonya cuisine so and if, if you look at nyonya cuisine and uh, compare with malay cuisine you will see that nyonya cuisine is not halal because the chinese hokkien uh, refugees arrive with their livestock they are accustomed to the food that they eat and the food that they eat is not halal. So we have uh, dishes such as the Tao Yu Ba, which is definitely not halal. And a lot of other dishes which is improvised and created here out of the necessity, out of necessity, they improvise according to whatever ingredients that's available. And they created their own laksa out of rice noodle because there's no bread, there's no wheat. So they created rice noodle. And one major item is that they were able to retain the use of their language, albeit with the inclusion of Malay loan words. So it is the inversion of the Peranakans. The Peranakans use Malay with the inclusion of Hokkien loan words because when there is no such word in the Malay vocabulary, they will add Hokkien words based on what they learned from their seafaring fathers. Here is a different story where everybody is around. The father and the mother and the children are all around and they are all speaking Hokkien. And so they were able to retain the use of their Hokkien language. However, they are going to come across things around them which is in Malay and not in Hokkien and that's when the uh, loan words will come in and words such that is as commonplace as uh, Jali and Batu becomes part of the language that we speak as Hokkien but it is traced back to actually the Peranakans uh, I'm sorry, not Peranakans but the Baba Nyonyas it traced to the Baba Nyonyas uh, were the Sikh population that created the language being used and when I said the language, I'm talking about the Hokkien language being used in the Malay Peninsula. And because the refugees came from two distinct groups, the Changzhou group fathered the Penang Hokkien language as well as the Hokkien dialect spoken on the northern part of the peninsula, whereas the Quanzhou group fathered the, uh, the Hokkien spoken on the southern part of the peninsula, which becomes Singapore Hokkien and Klang Hokkien. So Singapore Hokkien, Klang Hokkien traces itself to the Chenzhou dialect of the Hokkien language that was brought over by the Hokkien refugees. Now, both the Puranakans and the Babanyonyas mixed together, particularly in, in Malacca. They come to get, get to know each other and they will intermarry with each other. And so from today's standpoint, it is impossible for us to tear them apart anymore. They are so mixed together as with coffee has mixed with sugar. If you mix coffee with sugar, it's not possible for you to take out the coffee from the sugar anymore. And some people will call them, ah, they, they are Peranakan. 
which is true. They are Baba Nyonya, which is also true. But are they Aparanakan and Baba Nyonya the same? Well, I ask you, is coffee the same as sugar? No, right? Coffee is coffee, sugar is sugar. So coffee is not sugar, sugar is not coffee. Putting it together are uh, just combining the uh, the elements, the two different elements, and the characteristics of the two elements. But if you are able to tell apart, it's actually two different things. But they do have one thing in common. The Puranakas and the Babanyanya do have one thing in common. They live in a place where there is hardly any writing. There is no writing of history. They could not write even if they want to because they were illiterate. During that time, it's, uh, from, from our perspective in the 21st century, it's sometimes very difficult to understand time back then in the 17th or early 18th century because right now, literacy is universal. Everybody learns to read and write. But imagine a time when People do not learn to read and write. So everything is uh, passed down by oral tradition from one generation to the other. And it could happen to us also. Let me uh, give you an example. Let's say for example, I am forbidden from using English. I have to put English aside. And then I have to put Mandarin aside. And then I have to put Malay aside. In other words, all the languages that can be written down that I know of, and I, I gain my literacy from is I'm told you cannot use all this language. You rely on the one that you speak at home. So now I'm left with Hokkien. The Hokkien that I'm speaking at home right now is not much different from the Hokkien being spoken seven, in the 17th or early 18th century. It's spoken. So most people nowadays are using spoken Hokkien as they were back then. So if you look at the characteristics of the vernacular Hokkien or spoken Hokkien today, that's what it is. How many of us are able to write down the history according to our Hokkien language? No, we have to rely on English, Malay, Mandarin, whatever, to write down whatever, whether it's a report or story or whatever, we have to rely on some other languages to write. But if we were to rely only on Hokkien, then we are stuck with oral tradition and that's what they were the people back then they were stuck with their oral tradition they could not write down their history even if they want to but it was a time when they create a lot of things they were they create a lot of dishes at that time they were creating dishes out of necessity yeah they and the, the dishes that they create are the ones that we are enjoying today and we call them nyonya dishes, nyonya kue, nyonya everything. That is the wonderful contribution that the Baba Nyonyas gave to us. But they were illiterate, so they were not able to write down their history. And because they were not able to write down their history, we do not know much about their history. We can enjoy the food that they pass on to us because uh, it was passed one generation after to the other without having to really write it down, learn how to do it. Without measuring ingredients, learn it that way. That is how they do it. So that is the Baba Nyonya. So literacy did not come to them in these first two influx or waves of Chinese migrants. It comes on the third wave. And the third wave, we call it as the Lao Cat. Lao Cat means the old timers. Of course, they are the old timers from our perspective, but they were still newer than the first two. They were newer than the Puranakans and they were newer than the Baba Nyonyas. When do they come? They come when the gates finally reopen, the ports reopen, uh, peace has resettled in. Fuchen province and the Manchus were relaxed enough to allow a new wave of merchants to leave China to trade. So there's a new wave of uh, merchants leaving China and they would of course come to the different port cities to trade. And now, uh, in, when they come to trade, they would of course meet up with 
the existing group of Chinese people. And it makes life so much easier for them. If you compare this new uh, influx of merchants to the one during the Malacca Sultanate, the Malacca, those in the, during the Malacca Sultanate, they came no Chinese around, so they have to marry the Malay woman. Now, this new influx of merchants, they arrive and say, oh, got Chinese already. Not only got Chinese, those Chinese people are already speaking their language, already speaking Hokkien. So the infrastructure is put together for them. So that the merchants were able to come and not only come, they, they also have the idea of settling here because everything is all in place for them. It is so easy for them to settle and settle they did. They settled and uh, because they were merchants, they were able to keep lock or keep track of their records because they are literate. That's the main big difference between them and these first two groups. Literacy comes with the merchants. The merchants were literate and they brought along other people that are literate like the priests. The priests were literate. So being literate is means that you are the elite. Because during that part in time, only the elites have the chance to learn, to have the, the means they can afford to learn to read and write. So reading and writing for the rest of the population is like a mystery. They can see and perhaps they can know a few Chinese characters. But by and large, if you give them a, a scripture in uh, written in Chinese, they could not read. Because... Reading is something very challenging and there were very few tutors or teachers who are around to teach the population. Back then, schools are not universal. So when I talk about the arrival of this third group, which I call the Lao Cat, uh, the time is the 18th century going into the 19th century. And this coincides also with the founding of Penang, so the when the uh, when Penang was established in seventeen eighty six, uh, the the Babanyonyas around and possibly the Lao Cat have already arrived or were in the in the point of arriving, but Chinese were already around. But exactly, Peranakan is exclusive to Malacca. <coughs> Baba Nyonya is for the rest of the Malay Peninsula. Then came the Lao Cat. The Lao Cat would again go to all the places where there is an existing Chinese population. And the difference between them and the first two groups is that being merchants with their inclination to settle down, they were able to do one thing that the, the other two were not able to do, and that is to write history. Of course, they were writing history based on themselves. So, to assist themselves, they were based, they were group themselves according to guilds or clan association, or as we call it, Kongsi. We, they group themselves under Kongsi, and under the Kongsi, they were able to write their history and their genealogy because they were literate. They did note the presence of Chinese people around them who were illiterate. And they know that these are the Baba Nyonyas. But the, this Lao Cat are not able to write down the history of the Baba Nyonyas because the Baba Nyonyas history is already lost into the fog of time. Those illiterate people did not keep log of their history. So what we know now from the history is that based on looking at the writing of those who were able to read and write. So even as I'm explaining this to you, my knowledge of the Peranakan and the Babanyonyas is based on researching and you have to do like work arounds. Work arounds because the actual people who are involved could not write their own history. So we have to base on the research that is done on the history of people who were able to read and write. And that is how we understand the history of the Puranakans and the Babanyonyas. But the Lao Cats, they are self-centered. It's all about themselves. So history starts with them as far as they are concerned. 
they establish the clan association. So history start with their clan association. History start with their arrival according to what they have written down. So if we know history based on what uh, they wrote, then it seems to be like everything starts when they arrived. But actually no. The, the arrival of the Chinese in Malay Peninsula predates the arrival of this second wave of uh, merchants whom we call the Lao Cat. The Chinese has been around here in the Malay Peninsula with the, with the troubling possibility that they can't write. The problem is that they could not write their history and so the, that history, that part of history is lost. But even though that part of history is lost, it doesn't mean that they were not around. They were around except that they were muted. They can't speak about their history. But the Lao Cat were able to write their history. And so history that we know of in the written form is uh, from the time of the Lao Cat. And because of that, sometimes it gets distorted because we are basing it on what is reported by the Lao Cat. For example, if you read something in the newspaper, you can have two different newspapers reporting on the same event and they were saying some things that are not 100% the same. It's, it's the same because it's depending on how you write something. But they did contribute something in that they brought literacy around. Where else, uh, on the other hand, the Puranakas and the Babanyonyas remain illiterate. So, the Lao Kek were the merchants group. They also would marry into the, with the Puranakas and the Babanyonyas to form the local Chinese people. And nowadays, if you look back at them, are they uh, Chinese who are Babanyonyas or not? Some people put on uh, Babanyonya clothes and buy Babanyonya stuff and they call themselves Babanyonya. Or better still, they call themselves Puranakan. But how do we... Uh, substantiate that these are actually the Peranakan. Were they able to trace their roots back to the uh, the seafaring merchants of the 16th, 17th uh, centuries? A lot of them, or I can say almost everybody, could not do that. If you're, And how to prove that, considering the earlier people were illiterate? So that is the main problem in uh, in documenting the history of the Chinese of West Malaysia and Singapore. But from the Lao Cat onwards, uh, the Lao Cat were able to write their history and they wrote it using literary Chinese or classical Chinese. Classical Chinese is a marvelous invention. Cla through classical Chinese or literary Chinese, the merchants were able to keep lock, they could do write something and uh, the bureaucrats or the mandarins could read it, even though the mandarins were reading it from Beijing, in the Beijing pronunciation, where else the merchants were writing in Hokkien, in the Hokkien literary uh, reading. So the same text in Chinese characters can be read differently by different groups of people, even though they can't speak to each other. The the merchants will be speaking Hokkien vernacular, Hokkien among themselves, but when they were to write, they would revert to writing in classical Chinese, and the classical Chinese would be read by them in the Hokkien reading pronunciation. Where else, when they talk to each other again, it will be back to vernacular Hokkien. The vernacular Hokkien or colloquial Hokkien that they speak is the same Hokkien that we are speaking here in Penang, modern Penang nowadays, or Singapore, or anywhere else where Hokkien is spoken. That vernacular language, by and large, remain vernacular or spoken or colloquial. Where else the written form is a very high class thing that only the elites were able to learn to read and write. And for the rest of the Chinese people, and I'm talking about the Puranakans and the Baba Nyonyas, they have no access to learn this, like, this writing system, the classical Chinese, because this classical Chinese is kept so exclusively as something which they, the merchants would not like give away so easily. So uh, it is a great privilege to learn this if you, have no, you don't have the means to learn 
uh, you don't have the means to learn this if you are not part of their gang, uh, their group. So they will be kept among themselves. However, after the British came and established uh, Penang and so on, the British also established English schools. Cut off from access to classical Chinese, the Puranakas and the Babanyonyas get their education from English school and they became Anglophile. So they become all things English. They are the 19th century banana people where everything is yellow on the outside but white on the inside. So the Babanyonyas and Puranakas became Anglophile. They became uh, English educated because English was the first written language that they learned. Classical Chinese was not, uh, uh, they don't have the privilege of learning classical Chinese. They only had the chance to uh, receive education when the British arrived and the education is in English. And that is why the Straits Chinese, when we are talking about Straits Chinese, uh, talking about the Chinese living in Penang, Malacca and Singapore, Many of them were English educated right up to the 20th century because of the implant of English education since the beginning of the 19th century. And you have to remember that for much of the history, right up to the early part of the 20th century, Malaya did not exist. There were Malay states, but they were disparate separate Malay states and then there were the Strait Settlements. So the Strait Settlement has been around much longer than the Malay states for much of the 19th century. For that reason, we in Penang have greater connection and affiliation to those people in Singapore because we were part of the straight settlements and later as crown colonies right up to the Second World War. And uh, that keeps the folks in Penang and Singapore apart from the rest of Malaya. But after the Second World War, Penang and Malacca were put as part of Malaya. But with regards to the Chinese themselves, we we in Penang, Malacca and Singapore were part of the Baba Nyonya group. The, uh, the Baba Nyonya and the Lao Cat group. So during the 19th century, much of the uh, main cities were this, the ones in the straight settlements. And then from the mid 19th century onwards, there was the uh, industrial revolution. And with that, there is uh, slowly but eventually a big demand for tin. And with the demand for tin from the mid 19th century and accelerating to an influx in the 1870s and 1880s, it brought along a new and final influx of Chinese migrants from southern China. And this is once again a new migrants who are the majority of them were penniless, poor people and illiterate. So if you look at uh, the course of history, only the third group, the Lao Ke, were the ones who are literate, the merchants group. Where else the final influx is once again the coolie group and they are known as the Sing Ke. Sing Ke means the new guest. So they came from Fujian province and Guangdong province mostly, but also from Hai, Hainan and so on to populate uh, the Malay Peninsula. And unlike the, unlike the Lao Cat, they are once again the illiterate groups. Uh, and so majority of them could not read and write until much later in the 20th century. They came as workers, as coolies, as laborers to work in the tin mines, to work in the ports, and so on. By then, the mercantile activities of the Lao Cat mixed together with the Baba Nyonya has made them prosperous. And so, when you look at the beauty of Peranakan or Baba Nyonya style, it is a contribution not only of the Peranakans, 
all the Baba Nyonyas, but also of the Lao Cat. Because the Lao Cat are the ones who were the merchants, were the traders. They were the ones who uh, benefited from the tin mining prosperity. And the tin mining prosperity, starting from the mid-19th century onward towards the 20th century, was the golden years of what we call as the Peranakan culture today. So all things Peranakan came about because of the influx of money from the Lao Cat and the, uh, the culture that the Peranakans and the Baba Nyonya put together earlier than that. But one thing about the Sin Cat, the final influx is that they were so large in numbers that they overwhelmed the existing Lao Cat Baba Nyonya and Peranakans in numbers. I can say that each influx overwhelmed the one before it. So the Baba Nyonyas will overwhelm the Peranakan, the Lao Cat will overwhelm the Baba Nyonya and Peranakan, and now the Sin Cat will overwhelm these three preceding groups. And the, the Sin Cat populated not only the coastal towns, you will notice that straight settlements are all coastal towns, as well as think places like Mua and so on, because back then, there was no reason to go inland. Uh, it's all jungle back there. So why go so deep and establish a town deep in there? Until there is a reason, and that reason is tin mining. Starting with piping, and then uh, Ipo, Kuala Lumpur, Surumban, and so on, all these towns were open because of tin mining. And Taiping is unique among them in that it was established by merchants from Penang. And because it's established by merchants from Penang, the language that's spoken by the merchants in Penang were transported to Taiping. And so Taiping speaks Penang Hokkien. So the Penang Hokkien, or we can now call it as Taiping Hokkien, is fathered by Penang and the merchants of Penang. But not so not so the other towns. The other towns were brought in. Uh, they were Hakka miners, Cantonese miners that brought in and established Kuala Lumpur, Ipoh, Seremban, and so on. And so these other towns located inland on the peninsula speaks uh, Cantonese. So even to this day, they speak Cantonese. But what about Singapore? Singapore speaks the same Hokkien language, the Chencho Hokkien language that is spoken uh, along the southern part of the Malay Peninsula. But when the refugees arrived, there was not yet Singapore, just as there was not yet Penang. Because after, after the British got hold of Malacca from the Dutch, the, the British systematically tried to dismantle Malacca. They tried to demolish the fort and they would encourage the existing Chinese population in Malacca to either move north to Penang or move south to Singapore. And so the Peranakans and Babanyonyas of Malacca moved north or moved south. The majority of them moved south to this newly established and better equipped uh, settlement of Singapore. And so, the language that is spoken in Singapore, the Hokkien spoken in Singapore, traces itself to the southern part of the Malay Peninsula, which is the Chancho dialect of Hokkien. Where else, in Penang, uh, they use the Changcho dialect of Hokkien. But as for the Peranakans and the Bab the Peranakans themselves, uh, you can move anywhere you like. You can move to Penang, you can move to Singapore, and so... Uh, Today, if a person says that he is a Peranakan in Penang, but where does he come from, we do not know. Because there is not much written about his history. But most likely, if you are uh, genuinely a Peranakan, then you will trace yourself back to Malacca, and from Malacca, trace yourself back to the seafaring merchants who married a local Malay woman and started the seed population of your generations that goes all the way down to you. Assuming that you are not a an acculturated Puranakan. An acculturated Puranakan is someone who just purchased uh, Baba culture and everything to do Baba and then call himself Baba. 
and so on. So this is something which, although I'm explaining the history to you, it's something that is now very difficult to prove because uh, it's all mixed together and a big chunk of the history was not written down. And so if you look around us and it's, you ask me, uh, so where is the proof? So how can I prove it to you other than to show you all the events surrounding history and to explain to you? And this is how it makes sense about the arrival of the different influx of the Chinese in Malaya, as well as how our dishes, the Nyonya dishes were created. And why is there such a thing as a Peranakan? And if you look at uh, my explanation, once again, there are four different groups of Chinese influx. The first one is the Peranakan. The second is the Baba Nyonyas. And they are distinct in that the Peranakans speak Malay with the inclusion of Hokkien loan words. The Baba Nyonyas speak Hokkien with the inclusion of Malay loan words. And then came the, the Lao Cat which were the literate people who started writing history of the, themselves and became the history that we know today. But they were distinct from the first two groups. And finally, the Sinkat, which overwhelmed all of them and became most of us. Most of us, I believe, trace ourselves to the Sinkat. Uh, we are from the Sinkat. And many of the Sinkat came as coolies illiterate. At that time, uh, access to reading and writing is not good, open to you if you are simply a, a laborer or a coolie. However, in the 20th century, after the fall of the Qing Dynasty, there is a, 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 a revival, a total makeover of languages in China where they do away finally with classical Chinese and introduce Mandarin. So Mandarin was only introduced on the uh, early 20th century and that's when uh, Chinese schools start to teach in Mandarin. Many of the Chinese schools before that taught in the mother tongue, the vernacular. That is to say, uh, the Hokkien school will teach in Hokkien. Yes, Hokkien but they are actually learning classical Chinese pronouncing it in Hokkien. The Teochew school will likewise teach the pronunciation in Teochew but reading classical Chinese. But uh, the revamp of the education means that now Chinese education became universal. And so those Sinkat that previously had no chance to learn to read and write, finally had a chance to read and write. And But they learned to read and write not in Hokkien, not in Teochew or Cantonese. They learned to read and write in Mandarin. And so if you look left and right at people who are Mandarin educated, Today, it is traced to the early part of the 20th century when the Mandarin education was introduced. And that becomes the history of the Chinese in West Malaysia and Singapore. And well, that's the conclusion of my explanation. I hope that from this explanation, you can look left and right and start to make sense of who we are, our identity, of a Chinese person in West Malaysia and Singapore. And the things that you might not have been aware of now through this explanation becomes much clearer to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like it, please take a moment to give it a like so that YouTube will share this knowledge, this information with more people. Of course, I can't say that this is the final uh, video that I'll do on the history of the Chinese in West Malaysia and Singapore, I continue to research. I will continue to research and if I uncover something that contradicts what I have already learned, I am very very happy to revise what my knowledge because we must continue to learn, we must continue to read and continue to find out because it is something that is never ending. I will continue to find out and revise this knowledge as and when and I want to welcome you to join me in future videos by subscribing to this channel Learn Penang Hokkien. Yes indeed, this channel was created to popularize our Hokkien language.
Penang Hokkien in particular. But in this case, I am sharing with you the history that transcended not only Hokkien but all the languages of the Malay Peninsula, West Malaysia and Singapore. And if you have any questions, please put the questions down in the comment section and as soon as I see it, I will try to answer them for you. Thank you very much for watching this video. Kam selu, cece. Thank you.